Hi, this is Jed Lee. Before we start the show, I want to let the authors who listen to the show know all about our Reading With Your Kids Certified Great Read program. This is a wonderful program that we are really, really proud of. We developed this program to acknowledge books that kids and parents will absolutely love to experience together. If our panel of teachers, kids, and parents believe that your book is worthy of four or five out of five stars, it becomes a certified great read. And with that status comes a whole lot of promotional tools that can really help your book stand out from the crowd of books that are published every single month. Now, we don't want you to take our word for it. Listen to some of the really nice things that authors have, have written about the program. Laurie Orlinski, who's the author of Being Small is Not So Bad After All, and The Two Fairies Tummy Age, she wrote that the Certified Great Read program has really given me more credibility as an author when I'm pitching up my book to stores, libraries, and even media outlets. Marla Humer is the author of The Big Move. She writes, the Certified Great Read program provides the recognition that independent authors deserve. I have been pleased with the process and enjoyed receiving the professionally animated video announcements Jed and his team created. Using the video and podcast on my social media network has made an increased interest among readers. The Certified Great Read Seal of Approval shows readers that your book is award-winning and a guaranteed great read. The Certified Great Read program receives my stamp of approval. Check it out today. Go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click on the Authors Click Here button at the top of the page and scroll on down to Certified Great Reads. Reading with your kids. Hola, niha, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, mori mori wanji, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so very delighted and so very honored that you are joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Ghana, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Marissa Reichardt. She is here today to celebrate her YA novel. It's called A Shot at Normal. Hey, Marissa, how are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm pretty well, considering uh, all the craziness that we're living through. Yeah. It's um, interesting times, that's that's for sure. But but we're all getting through it, right? We, we are. We are. Mostly. And, yeah. <laughs> Mostly. Uh, yeah, how we're getting through it is a topic for another conversation, but I can't wait yeah. for you to tell us about A Shot at Normal. Yes. Yeah, so A Shot at Normal, it's actually a young adult novel. Um, it's about... Uh, 16-year-old Juniper Jade, who has been homeschooled by her anti-vaxxer parents, and after contracting the measles, uh, fights her parents for the right to be vaccinated. After being exposed to this one disease, she realizes that she wants to be protected against other diseases and protect other people as well by being vaccinated herself. So this was written pre-COVID, and um, it's kind of wild. Yeah. <laughs> now... You're, you're not an expert, but you wrote about parents who are anti-vaxxers, so you must have some kind of insight into the mind of folks who are against vaccines, uh, afraid of vaccines. Can you share a little bit, because we're all dealing with this right now, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're hearing this every day in the news, and the government is considering mandates, and schools are you know, demanding that people be vaccinated in workplaces. Um, and for those of us who have been vaccinated, a, a lot of us just don't understand why in the world wouldn't you want this? But people have strong reasons for it. Yeah, I mean, the reason the book came, the, the idea came to me in the first place, because I was seeing people that I knew uh, not vaccinating their babies. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, again, pre-COVID. Um, and, and I started to wonder, well, what does that look like when those babies are teenagers and are socially left out of things that they maybe want to do? Attend public school where you have to show proof of vaccine to start 
preschool. I mean, I've had to show proof of vaccine for my daughter from preschool, then kindergarten, then seventh grade, all the way into college now. Um, I think the, the, the misconception or the something that it seems people want to do is is sort of portray anti-vaxxers as this evil that, you know, that we're all against. And I think the thing that to understand about it is, you know, a lot of the times these are parents in, in Juniper's case, parents that are really coming from a place of wanting to love and protect their children. And so as a parent myself, I could understand that part of where they were coming from. And that's what was interesting to me about writing them because um, I love my child. I would do anything to protect her. Uh, that's why I had her vaccinated. Mm -hmm. But there's another side of the population that thinks um, that's not the thing to do to protect your child. So I think just to, to, to understand that they are coming from a place of well-meaning uh, wanting to protect their kids, um, that's what I think is the most important thing to understand here and not uh, get so, try not to get so angry about it. Yeah. And that's true, uh, you know, and, and certainly, and we're going to get back to the book, but I really hope that we, uh, if, if we're encouraging our friends to get vaccinated, let's do it in a loving and a kind way where we're showing <laughs> compassion and understanding. I know myself, Marissa, when my son was you know, born and getting his first vaccines, and I actually read the warnings that come with it, that, you know, with the teeny weeny print and it's, you pull it out and it's like a mile long. And I started reading some of the um, potential side effects and I was terrified, mm -hmm. you know, so there's, there's reason for concern. Um, you know, the chances of somebody having an uh, adverse reaction are, are very slim, one in a million, one in two million, but there are people that have that. And um, uh, so we have to, have to, have to you know, un understand where, where people are coming from. Juniper's parents sound pretty interesting, even beyond the anti-vaxxer um, viewpoint. Yeah, they were they were fun to write. Um, uh, they're ex hippies, but hippies that grew up in the 80s and 90s and didn't go to the first Woodstock, but went to the second Woodstock. Um, they have a composter in their backyard and uh, he's a freelance editor that works from home. The dad is and they teach their kids school in the kitchen. Uh, as Juniper says, their mascot is a vacuum cleaner. Um, <laughs> so uh, they were they were very interesting to write. And there's actually a lot that's very lovable about them. And that was that helped to strike a balance between, um, you know, well, Juniper's the hero of the story. And uh, we're rooting for her to, to get what she's fighting for. Um, seeing where her parents are coming from all the time. They have, they, they have a lot of time on the page. And I really wanted to present that loving, close family unit uh, for exactly the reasons that we were just talking about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can you really become an ex-hippie? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a really good question. I mean, I guess I just feel like as someone that grew up in the 80s, I, you know, I am just was thinking of people – they grew up in the sixties and were suddenly, you know, teaching us at school in suits mm -hmm. and ties. And it felt like, did they sell out? But, um, <laughs> but now as somebody who is old enough to be the person that would be looked back on and be saying, you know, maybe you're not a hippie anymore. And it's like, no, no, no. Yeah. You know, I'm always 17 in my head. Right. <laughs> that's why, I, that's why I write young adult books. <laughs> yes. As somebody who's been um, accused of being a hippie many times, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's an honor. It's, it's I, I wear that with pride. I do. I do take it as an honor. Uh, I grew up in the '60s, and but I have to tell you, sometimes I really don't like seeing, uh, you know, what I wore to high school um, <laughs> being sold in a costume shop at Halloween. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anytime there's a theme party for the decade that you grew up in, it, it, it's a little reminder that. Mm -hmm. You've gotten older. <laughs> yeah. Yes, much older. <laughs> hey, where did the inspiration for Juniper come from? 
Um, so like I was saying, it, it came from seeing friends that were mm-hmm. making choices not to vaccinate their, their kids and then just sort of spinning out from that, imagining that future. Um, also, I mean, it's funny. I was working on another book and I was trying to come up with the background of a small side character that barely had much of a part in the book. And I started coming up with this whole elaborate story that she was homeschooled and she was finally like going to public school for the first time in high school. And it was because her parents had been anti-vaxxers and she wanted to be vaccinated. And I was like, Marisa, what are you doing? This is a whole book. This isn't a five minute side character. <laughs> um, so I think that that's the, the fun and interesting part of writing is that it's always happening. Um, the ideas come to you in ways that you could never imagine, whether it's in line at the grocery store or something that somebody is being interviewed on the news has to say, or an, any conversation that you eavesdrop on, which all writers do a lot. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it came very organically. And then once it was there, it was that kind of idea that wouldn't stop. I was working on another book and um, edit. I had edits due to my editor, and I set everything aside, and I sat down and wrote the first 25 pages of Juniper over a weekend, and I sent it to my agent that Monday and was like, look, I know this isn't what I'm supposed to be doing right now, but I can't not do this. This is all I hear in my head, and once I send it to you, it will be yours, and I can go work on the other thing, but um, yeah, so that's that's how Juniper came to be. Tell me, did the story, you, you, you mentioning that you started writing this book before the pandemic, mm-hmm. but it's, you know, the creative process continued once we went into lockdown. Did that change the story? Um, I think that what happened, so, so I was actually in copy edits, which is sort of the last stage that you do with a novel in March of 2020. And I turned those in about two weeks into when we were all on lockdown. Um, and so I think that looking back now with the knowledge that I have in a post COVID world, there probably are things that I would have done a little bit differently, but at the same time, I'm, it's fascinating how much of this book, the conversations that are being had, the reasoning for wanting to be vaccinated, the reasoning for not wanting to be vaccinated. They're all still very much the same conversations that people are having. I think what has happened more is that the lens that the book is being looked at has shifted. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I'd be so curious to see pre, you know, pre COVID, how, how would this book have been looked at? Because most of the conversations end up uh, going to COVID. Mm-hmm. And I think it's also, it's a double-edged sword because it's being judged in a post, a, a pre-COVID written book is also being judged in a post-COVID world. And there's just things I couldn't have known mm-hmm. um, when I was writing this, but I still think it's, um, it's interesting. It's interesting to explore it from that perspective. And I'm proud of it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it is interesting because it gives us uh, a look into the lives of not only parents who are anti-vaxxers and humanizing them and, and helping us hopefully understand other you know folks who are uh, taking that position, but it also gives us a look into the life of a girl who is homeschooled. And for, you, you know, before the pandemic, the, the thought of learning at home was just such an alien thought to so many kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and what and the reality is what what kids experienced, what most pu- public school kids experienced uh, during covid was not homeschooling as uh, I that ju- the Juniper uh, experience. But that's something, um, you know, a lot of us don't know kids who are homeschool and Mm -hmm. we have these preconceived notions that they're weird and they don't get along with people and they have no social skills. And that for the most part, isn't true. I I agree. It's not true. Um, And, and there's a lot of great things to be said about homeschooling and, and it's that same thing with anything. Like it's right for some people and not right for other people. Um, In the book, Juniper has two siblings uh, her sister absolutely loves being homeschooled. She wouldn't ever want anything else. Uh, Juniper feels like she's missing out. They 
also happened to live across the street from the high school. So she looks out of her window every day and sees everybody showing up, the cheerleaders in their uniforms, people pouring off the bus, people coming up on skateboards and um, feels like she's missing out on these rites of passage of, uh, you know, teenagerhood. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, strange to align that with our COVID times. I had a daughter that was a senior in high school um, so she missed out on prom oh. and, you know, barely, barely got through that we ended up getting to have a graduation, but, um, you know, went on lockdown in her junior year. And so in some ways, I felt like this book ends up being a love letter to teenagerhood and those rites of passage. And I think it also, um, you know, the things, one of the things Juniper is just dying to do is to eat in the school cafeteria. She has this idea in her head that the, <laughs> this is where things happen, right? Like she's watched a couple of movies with her grandmother and she, she's, you know, we all see the school cafeteria and the teen movies and, uh, this guy that she meets, Nico, is just like, man, you are going to be really disappointed when you finally get into the school cafeteria. It is not what you think it is. But I think that the book, um, the little things that Juniper wants to do like that and go to a school dance and go to a school football game help to remind you to not take the typical things for granted. And I think that's really what this last year of the pan year plus now of the pandemic has shown us. Um, going grocery shopping without feeling like you have to put on 10 layers of, of masks and uh, protective gear, you know, like just the little things that we used to be able to run in and out of and do that maybe we took for granted how mm -hmm. special that actually is. And yeah. so I hope it makes people sit back a little bit and appreciate some of those things. Yeah, absolutely. Boy, I remember those early days of the pandemic going to the grocery store. Not only did you have to suit up and mask up, but you got the stuff home. You had to wipe everything down with. <laughs> yeah, we were wiping Clorox. down. We were un undressing, uh, you know, next to the washing machine and dumping all the clothes in immediately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. different. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that in addition to talking about the, the, the pandemic, I, this would be a great book for a family to co-read together um, that would spark some great conversations uh, about differences that kids and parents have with each other. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Juniper wants to be vaccinated so she can go to school, but there are lots of kids who want to do something that their parents just won't let them do. I'm thinking this this might be a great way to kind of get some of those conversations going Um uh, that maybe were difficult to have. Uh... I agree. I, I think it's a starting off point. I think uh, fundamentally uh, at the at the core, the struggles that Juniper is going through are not different than a lot of teenagers who just want something or disagree uh, with their parents. Uh, what does that look like when the when what you figure out you don't agree with your parents about? is, um, you know, morally, politically, uh, religiously, those, those questions that teenagers start to have. And so this book can open up conversations like that, uh, where teens can have those kinds of discussions with their parents. I, I think that's wonderful. I think that's what makes uh, young adult books amazing. I'd love to see more parents reading uh, the same books their kids are reading because I think they open up tons of opportunities for conversation. That being said, I still very much, you know, think young adult books are for teenagers and that's important to remember as well. That that's yeah. the audience we're writing for. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I, I hear parents all the time, you know, complaining, you know, ask my kid how, how school was. It's good. What's going on? Nothing. You know, yeah. they go in their room and they're glued to their device or, you know, they're locked in their room. And a great way to have those conversations with kids is to allow them to talk about something that's not personal. Yeah. Don't, you know, don't I, – I, I, this is my life and it's private and leave me alone. Okay, mm -hmm. well, let's talk about Juniper. And yeah. inevitably, inevitably something about them is going to come up in the conversation. Yeah, I agree. I feel like that's where I've had the most interesting conversations with my daughter is when she comes and tells me about something they talked about in class or something she read, but not when I say, what did you do today? How was that test? How was that, you know, 
how was your swim meet? Like mm-hmm. that, that wasn't the stuff she wanted to talk to me about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mom, leave me alone. Yeah. yeah. And, and if you just wait long enough, this was my husband's philosophy all the time. He's like, uh, he's, he's a lot quieter and mellower than I am. So they would go places and drive together and he'd be like, Oh, she just wouldn't stop talking. And I said, well, that's because you weren't talking. And he's like, exactly. You, you yeah. need to wait and let her start the talking. Uh, sometimes it took 30 minutes, but you know, eventually she wanted to fill the quiet space, I guess. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. I have a, a wonderful niece. I spend lots of time with, she's 17 and we have lots of very quiet drives sometimes. Yeah, exactly. And it's, and it's okay. I agree with that as well. It's like, if that's the safe space for them to be quiet and be able to check out, then I'm always here to offer that. Yeah. Marissa, you were saying that, you know, deep down you're a still 17 years old and that's why you write these YA books. Um, do you, do you, do you ever find yourself wanting to write for adults or is this just your comfort zone and this is where you want to be? I think the, I just have yet to come up with an idea that is for adults. And so I don't know if that is because I'm only supposed to be writing YA, but when that idea comes to me, that's an adult book idea, I will certainly um, look into that. I have something that's brewing a little bit in the back of my mind, but it just seems that inevitably when I, when something pops into my head, it's, it's something about teenagers. I mean, obviously I could have written Juniper from the parents' point of view, but that's not nearly as interesting. You know, what was interesting was, the kid who wanted to do something that she legally couldn't do. Yeah. Hey, you mentioned earlier that, you know, this idea for Juniper kind of came, you know, uh, kind of out of nowhere, you're working on this little side character and writing something down about that. And then it just blew up and you couldn't get it out of your mind. And, um, until you wrote up that first 25 pages and gave them to your agent, then you were able to get back to doing what you were, what, what, what you were supposed to be working on. Mm-hmm. Is that a good technique you would um, suggest other authors kind of uh, work on when they're, you know, supposed to be doing, working on project A, but project B is just screaming to them and, you know, right. we'll do something and just put it in somebody else's hands so you can get back on task. I think to an extent that might be, but I also think that writers have a habit of want of, of running toward the next shiny thing and we can distract ourselves that way and think that they, we need to be doing that instead of what we're actually supposed to be doing. Um, so I like to look at it more as a, as a reward. Mm-hmm. Hey, if you get this done, then you get this amount of time to maybe, you know, work on this other thing that that's, that's interesting to you. Um, because I feel like there's almost a, a running joke that as soon as you get your edit letter, uh, you want, you come up with your next book idea. Right. And, um, I don't know if that's self-preservation or, or what, but I, I mean, I, so I think if you look at it more like a reward, I mean, what I probably should have done was a day of work and then worked on what I was supposed to do, but I don't regret in this case that I did it the way I did it. Well, we don't regret it either. I'm really excited. People should definitely check out A Shot at Normal. Uh, Marissa, where can people go to find out more about your book and also find out more about you? Uh, so I am on Twitter at Young Adultish. I am on, I, I should have aligned all of my names on all my social media, but I haven't. I'm on Instagram at Marisa Reichart Books. And I'm at MarisaReichart.com where you can find links to events and interviews and information about all my books and where to buy them. Awesome. We've had a great time speaking with the author of A Shot at Normal, a great YA title from our guest, Marisa Reichardt. Hey, Marisa, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks so much for having me. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guests will be Carl Rollins and Patty DeDore, two great authors celebrating their new children's books. Hey, if you are the author of a fantastic children's book, we would love to help you tell the world all about it. You know, being a guest on the Reading With Your Kids podcast, it's fun, it's easy, it doesn't cost you a thing, 
gives you the chance to tell thousands of people about your fantastic book. All you need to do is go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com, click on the Authors Click Here button at the top of the page, scroll on down to be a guest. You can also find out about our certified great read program. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Chris, I want to start by thanking our guest, Marissa Reichardt. Be sure to check out A Shot at Normal. I also want to thank my team, Alejandro Doherty, Fatima Khan, Michael Murphy, Rory Grady. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.